I think there's probably been maybe one or two times in my life that I've had the privilege to have a seven course dinner. I mean, this is, this is huge. This is, you know, just, just crazy. But the thing with, with so many different courses, it's not about the volume of food that you eat. It's about all the different tastes and all the different textures and different temperatures and colors and so forth. And to put that whole package together in, in such a way that you just, uh, even after you finish one course, you're looking forward to the next. And you're looking forward to the next. And then finally that dessert comes out and it just caps off the evening and it's just like, oh, wow, what an experience. What a wonderful thing. Today we're going to be looking at a passage in Isaiah, Isaiah 61, where it just speaks of grand and glorious things. God inspires and fills Isaiah with this grand vision of what is coming, a beautiful picture of, of glorious peace and, and joy. But there's something that we have to understand about, about prophecy and prophetic fulfillment. It's, it's kind of like a mountain range. When you see a mountain range from the distance, it just looks like, oh, flat. There's this one picture. There are mountains. But as you get closer and closer, you begin to see that there are layers, a closer range and then a little further and then a little further and a little further. And then finally that, that, that range that is back there. And, and those mountains stretch back for miles and miles. Well, so also with prophetic fulfillment, there is something that, is in the, um, that has an immediate impact on the people who are hearing that message for the first time. The Israelites, the people of Judah, those who are in captivity, hear this message uh, from Isaiah, and it's like it fills them with hope in the moment, in the present, in the now. But then there is a little later fulfillment as well, a, a short-term uh, future fulfillment so that when these people return back from Babylon and settle back into that land, that there is this, you know, wow, these things God is bringing about. God is fulfilling His promises. But as we'll recognize in our message today, that even in that short-term fulfillment, there is still a longing for even more. That the glory that the prophets spoke about comes up short in that short-term future. That there's a long-term fulfillment, that there's a distant day still yet coming where God will completely fulfill His promises. And so we look. We've looked through this Advent season at the different prophecies about Jesus. And they had an immediate impact on the people just in the day, what they heard. And there was the short-term fulfillment, but then also a long-term fulfillment either. That for us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. That a shoot will grow up from the stump of Jesse and, and, and will bring about peace and righteousness. That there will be the servant of the Lord and the bruised reed he will not break, and the smoldering wick he will not snuff out. And then on Christmas Day, we talked about Emmanuel, that the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, God with us. But today we focus our attention on the fact that God is saving the best for last. God is saving his very best. For last, just like that seven-course meal, it's good, it's good, but it gets better and better and better until finally at the end it's like, ah, oh, that was amazing. That was wonderful. So we're going to look together at Isaiah 61. Isaiah then speaking the voice of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. And we look at this passage and we just see that this person is an anointed one. In Hebrew, you would say Messiah, Mashiach. 
an anointed one. Anointed with the Spirit of God. Anointed to go out and do good. Good news for those who are suffering. Good news for those who are brokenhearted. Good news for those who are held captive. And for those who have lost their way or in tragic, complicated situations. Good news falls upon their ears and this messenger of the Lord, this servant of the Lord, the one on whom the Lord has anointed and put his spirit, is this bringer of and accomplisher of the good news. He will proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Known from, from the uh, uh, law of Moses as Jubilee. Jubilee came, was supposed to come every 50 years, and at the end of the 50 years, it would be a time of resettling of debts. That those who were, you know, for whatever reason, poor choices, poor economy, poor growing conditions, had fallen behind, had to sell themselves into slavery, had to sell their land, had to do whatever, and were in, in uh, you know, dire economic circumstances, is like, push the reset button. Everything restored everything made new and whole as it was supposed to be. This year of the Lord's favor, where you find, ah, this is wonderful. But then also a day of vengeance for our God. Now, we don't really necessarily like that word vengeance, but if you're a person who has had to suffer unjustly, if you have no political clout, no, you know, wealth to, to, to push your way around. But those who do push you around and make life miserable for you, then vengeance brings comfort. You entrust to the great just judge to work this out on your behalf and to do what is right and good. And vengeance from God comes to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And you can understand the, these words falling upon the ears of captives in Babylon whose city was destroyed and the temple burned to the ground and they're carried off into exile and their whole spirit is defeated and mourning and say, Lord, why have you brought this upon us? But God will bring vengeance and renewal and hope to these broken, hurting people and bestow on them the crown of beauty, the oil of joy and garment of praise instead of all those things of mourning. They will be called oaks of righteousness. What a beautiful word picture. An oak tree, a symbol of strength and stability. A tree that can withstand harsh winds and drought conditions because its roots are sunk down deep. An oak of righteousness, people who are, who are solid and firm in the law of the Lord and keep that law day and night. They're like a tree planted by streams of water. Oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. This beautiful oak tree of a believer which brings glory to God because God has planted that person and helped them grow strong and deep. They will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Again, this whole picture of renewal, restoration, a refilling of hope. Strangers will shepherd your flocks and foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. It's a picture of prosperity and wealth. They will be called priests of the Lord, people who have, can devote full time to, to worshiping and serving and praising God because God is caring for all of their affairs. You'll be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations and in their riches you will boast because God will bring them to you. Instead of shame, you'll receive a double portion. A double portion is that which is reserved for the firstborn. 
that he gets the double portion of the inheritance as the firstborn. And so all of God's people, Israel, God's chosen son, will receive this double portion. And instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. You will inherit a double portion in your land, and everlasting joy will be yours. It's a picture of, of, of the, uh, the marriage ceremony in which, you know, in a village when there's a marriage happening, it's an all-out party. And, and the father, you know, pulls out all the stops and, and there's the wine and the, and the food and, and it, it just carries on and on. But eventually it has to end and you got to go back to work, right? But no, in this day it will be an everlasting joy because god the husband will call us the bridegroom to himself and there'll be this rich celebration that continues on and on and on for i the lord love justice i hate robbery wrongdoing in my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I will delight greatly in the Lord. This is the response now. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. This is this beautiful picture of our state, of our condition, when God brings about and fulfills his promises in our lives for as the soil makes the sprout grow up and a garden causes the seeds to grow, so it is the sovereign Lord who will make righteousness and praise spring up before all the nations. This is this magnificent picture that God gave to Isaiah, that Isaiah communicated to the broken, hurting, captive people of Israel and Judah. And so with this vision comes great delight. But there's also disappointment. Great delight. Because many wonderful things did take place. Through Cyrus, the people were brought back to their land. The temple was rebuilt. And so what, there was this restoration. But yet somehow it didn't quite measure up to the beauty and the glory and the expanse of Isaiah's words, God's promise. It's an interesting passage in, in the book of Ezra. Ezra was a part of that return from Babylon to Israel and was put in charge of kind of helping the nation in this restoration project. And, and he did a very capable, wonderful job. But you see, when the builders had laid the foundation for the temple of the Lord, and then the priests in their vestments and all the trumpets and the Levites, which are the sons of Asaph, with symbols, they take up their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. When all of this is going on, with praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, He is good, His love toward Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundations of the house of the Lord was laid. Great delight, yes. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads, those who were old enough to remember the former days, who had seen the former temple, they wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid while many others shouted for joy. Why did they weep? Because they remembered the glory of Solomon's temple and the magnificence and the gold and the marble and the cedar wood and all of those things. They remembered what it was like when they were kids. When I was a kid, you know how that goes. But now this temple, it was like it was in black and white. It was nice, 
They were back in their homeland, but it just didn't compare to what was before or to what they sensed was God's promise through Isaiah. And so delight and disappointment went hand in hand. Yes, thank you, God, for restoring us to our land, but somehow, God, it's just not quite what we were hoping for, what we understood from your word. John the Baptist, at the time of Jesus, had a similar experience. On the one hand, for John the Baptist, it was great when when Jesus arrived on the scene and he saw him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and this is the promised one, and he's going to set things right again. But there was a time when John the Baptist was in prison. For speaking what is true and what is right and upholding God's law, but King Herod, or I, uh, I think it was Herod, didn't appreciate John's truth and put him into prison. And when John, sitting in prison, hears about the deeds of the Messiah, Jesus, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? John is sitting in prison while Jesus is going around doing good and healing people. But John is like, get with the program, Jesus. Kick out the Romans. Get rid of Herod. Set up God's kingdom again. Come on. I'm in prison. This is not fun. I want to see the glories of the new kingdom. It's all that nice stuff that you're doing out there, Jesus, but... Where is the vengeance? Where is the justice? Where is making things right once again? Are you going to do it or should we expect someone else? And this is Jesus' reply. Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. And those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Jesus is echoing, maybe not quoting directly, but echoing the promises of Isaiah 61, our passage. And then he says, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. John, you need to understand I am the Messiah. I am doing exactly what my Father wants me to do. But maybe what you see as perhaps of one flat picture, all of it needs to be accomplished right now. God's plan is to work it out in layers of fulfillment. John, don't stumble. Don't lose heart. Don't lose faith. I am the one that you were expecting. But let God work it out in his time, in his process, in his way. Folks, do you ever feel like one of the old people of Ezra's day? I'm not commenting on age here. But in terms of expectations, in terms of remembering the glory of before or what you anticipate to come, and it's just not as good as you hoped. Or maybe you're like John the Baptist. Do you ever feel like him sitting in prison when you're, when you're going through this tough spot in life and it's just like you can't get past it and you're just like, Jesus, I thought that you were the one who's going to make it all good and right in my life. And it's those times that we need to go back to Isaiah 61. And reread it again. But remember the layers of fulfillment, the immediate impact, the short term fulfillment, but then there is also a long term fulfillment. And to not lose heart, to not stumble and fall, to not give up on the promises of the Messiah, but to wait for them with eager anticipation. Eager anticipation. 
fully believing that God will do what he has promised, though you may have to wait for it. And the author of Hebrews 11 picks up on that with Abraham. He says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, he obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. And by faith he made his home in the promised land, but he did it like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as so did you know, Isaac and, and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. But he was looking forward to the day, or he's looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Abraham in his lifetime did not receive the fullness of all the promises that God made to him. The fullness would yet be coming later. All of these people, the, Hebrew, uh, the writer of Hebrews goes on to say, all these people were living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country that they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. But instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. They were all coming. They were all commencing a commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something even better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Would they receive the fullness, the fulfillment. I remember as a little kid, I don't know what else, I was probably around five years old. And it was Christmas Day. And we were all excited as, Chris, as kids are. And we gathered around the Christmas tree and my, my brothers and sisters, you know, they got a present. And they opened it up. Oh, thank you, Mom and Dad. And you know, we weren't into the big Santa Claus thing. You know, thank you, Mom and Dad. And, you know, thank you. And, you know, all of this and so forth. And, you know, maybe I got a, like a pair of socks or, you know, or some clean underwear or something like that, you know. But I mean, in terms of what my brothers and sisters were getting, I wasn't getting much at all, you know, and kind of those lumps of coal kind of coming, going through your head, you know. He knows when you're sleeping. <laughs> I was like, what, what is this? I mean, even though the, the Christmas tree was full of presents, to me it looked like this, empty. Because I wasn't getting much of anything. And I was kind of wondering, what is this all about? Until we got all done. And I'm kind of going. You know, and then everybody kind of looks at me. Well, you know, Dave, did you have a good Christmas? You know, you've got to fight back the tears. You know, it was a nice Christmas. Thank you. <laughs> well, 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 Dave, guess what? We saved one last present for you. You did? Yeah, we did. And it's been something that you've been wanting for a long time. Dave, come on up to the back. Come on out to the back porch. And there was the drum set that I was longing for. No, I didn't look like that, but it was a fun picture. I think my parents really regretted giving me that drum set, though. <laughs> But it's kind of like that. Christmas comes, and we have high expectations. We have all these desires, and how everything should go with family or gifts or friends or food or, or whatever. And, and when you get done, it's just kind of like, it was nice, but it wasn't everything I longed for. And so it is in the Christian life. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you for what I do have. Thank you for these blessings. But... It, Still, when I read the Bible, there's so much more. And that's because God is saving the best for last. 
those layers of fulfillment, the final chapter is still coming. The last book of the Bible still yet, yet needs to be completely fulfilled. And when you get to the end of Revelation and you look in chapter 21, it does pick up the language of Isaiah 61. John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Don't go through that one too quickly. No more death or mourning or crying or pain. No more. No more. No more. No more. What is your no more? No more arthritis. No more cancer. No more visiting a cemetery yearly for one who died way too soon. No more fighting in the family. No more divorce and broken, hurting children. No more just trying so hard, but just feeling like you're scraping to get No more powerful temptations or addictions which still tend to plague you and tempt you and cause you to fall. No more enemies out there who just seem to have it in for you and want to bring you down. What is your no more? Friends, in that day, it will be no more. No more. He who is seated on the throne says this, I am making everything new. God is saving. Lord Jesus, sometimes it feels like we still have chains. We're still burdened. We're still frustrated. We don't have the fullness. But give us eyes of faith, like Abraham, to see the new day. Fill our minds with vision, like John in Revelation, to see the new heaven and the new earth coming down out of heaven from God. Fill our hearts with hope and confidence as we wait to be free. Free, for you are making all things new. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you please arise for the blessing? Praise to you. Now the dwelling of God is with his people and he will wipe every tear from their eyes no more sorrow no more mourning no more pain no more death god is making all 